Good morning, church family and ministry friends. I'm Pastor Stephen Brooks. Welcome today to our online, internet, around the world church service. And I'm so glad that you're here today. Before we jump into today's message, I want to talk today, of course, in our message about the importance of godly friendships. But before that, let's honor the Lord first by receiving the holy tithes and the offerings. I would like to read a couple of scriptures from Leviticus chapter 27, beginning in verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. Verse 32, and concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock of whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. Praise God. So my friends, the tithe of all of our increase belongs to the Lord. Of course, there's many other scriptures that also uh, validate this principle and this truth. And the tithe is very, very fascinating. In the Greek, the word tithe means 10%. Uh, in the New Testament is written in Greek. But in the Old Testament, when we look at the word tithe in Hebrew, it also means 10%. But in Hebrew, it also carries the meaning, not only of 10%, but that the 10% is given to God up front. In other words, it's not like you tithe at the end after you've paid all your bills. No, you tithe, but you also tithe first. That's the first thing you do with your increase. Praise God. So here's a good question. Why do we tithe? T-I-T-H-E. Why do we tithe? Well, we tithe because of obedience to God's clearly defined commandments. But also, along with this element of obedience, we could ask the, the question even, well, why do we obey? Okay, so we're going to be obedient, but why are we going to obey? And that brings us this, to the second point, and that is because of honor. And this is really big in the eyes of God. Let's go over to 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 29. The Lord is speaking here concerning this situation of Eli, the high priest, and his refusal to correct his rebellious sons. Verse 29, why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering which I have commanded in my dwelling place. And the Lord says, this is the Lord speaking to this man. And he says, and honor your sons more than me to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, far be it from me for those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Praise God. Now, this is something very, very fascinating about the tithe. I tithe because when I study Scripture, I see throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament that the Lord Jesus is still receiving the tithe today, and that we should be tithers. I know that we tithe by grace. I know that we tithe by faith. But the bottom line is that I'm going to be obedient because I know that tithing establishes a covenant, a financial covenant between the tither and God who is receiving the tithe. But alongside obedience, I also tithe because I want to honor God as being first in my life, especially in the area of finances, which is an area that many Christians have a very, very difficult area in putting God first. Praise the Lord. Now, my friends, every time that you tithe, you demonstrate that you honor God first. You demonstrate, you're validating that God is first in your life. Now, a non-tither may say, well, Pastor Stephen, I, I don't believe in tithing, and, uh, you know, and they give some random excuse that they've never studied out. Uh, but the bottom line is, in this area for the non-tither, they would not admit it, but they might as well. The reason that they don't tithe uh, 
is because they don't want to honor God as being first in their finances. They're first and nobody's going to change that. And the Lord says, if you honor me, I'll honor you. But if you dishonor me, then I'll lightly esteem you. Wow. So I want to be obedient, but I also want to honor the Lord. Well, Pastor Stephen, I, I know the tithe means uh, 10%, but I'm going to do my own thing. I think I'll just give two or three because that's what I feel like doing. Well, that means that you are honoring your own self or you're honoring other things that you're doing with God's own tithe. And you know what? He sees all of that. This thing of honor is, uh, is a subject matter that has never been fully understood by the modern church. Woo, praise God, but it is of extreme importance. And when you dishonor the Lord with your money and the tithe that belongs to him, you don't give it to him, but you go and spend it on something else. You spend God's holy tithe on something else is dishonorable. It's disobedient. Now, I know people argue about whether it's disobedient or not. I believe the tithe belongs to the Lord. But I'll tell you one thing. There is the bridge you can't jump over. It shows that God is not first in your finances. Pastor Stephen, this is my money. I can do whatever I want with it. Well, you know what? The Lord says that the tithe is His. But if you want to govern your own life, wow, and push God back, and then if you do give something, you give it at the end after everything else has been done. It all screams that God, I'm glad you saved me. I want to go to heaven, but you're not first in my life. So for many Christians, they can say, Jesus is my savior. But the reality of him being also their Lord, uh, that's another issue. Praise God. Um, for me, ever since I caught the revelation of tithing, I've been dialed into it. I've always known in my heart, this is the truth. And I not only want to obey, I want to honor the Lord. Praise God. So some that they just have these, uh, these areas where not only are they not going to obey, but they're also not going to honor the Lord either. Wow. It's really remarkable. Praise God. You know, a guest minister just came in, into town to speak in a local conference. He's a very well-known uh, spirit-filled author. He has sold over, um, I think the last count was like 11 million books. So he's world famous. Uh, almost every uh, probably church in the world has heard of this minister. So he came to speak at this conference and said, he said, hey, Stephen, why don't you come out to the conference? Because um, uh, I've really enjoyed your books. And so I said, okay, I'll come on out. So I went out to this conference. Why? To honor him, to honor him. He has invited me to come. And so I'm going to honor him. So I was very busy. This has been an extremely busy week. I'm, uh, you know, carrying on uh, multiple meetings this week. I have uh, international meetings in uh, Singapore, Taiwan, uh, all of this being virtual, but all of these demands. So I, but even still, I said, okay, I'm going to come. So I made room. And I went out there and as he got up to speak and uh, I was sitting on the front row when he got up to speak, he told everybody in the audience and it's also was being streamed on the internet. He said, I just want everybody to know that in this one subject area, he said, I really wanted to know more about it. He said, I only found now, remember, this is the man that has sold over 11 million books. He said, I only found that there were two people in the entire body of Christ that have ever written a book on this. And he said, one of them is Stephen Brooks. I would like to honor him right now for his teaching. And of course, he had read my book and studied it because he was wanting to get further insight on that as well. So he has me stand up as the whole uh, congregation says, praise God for Stephen and what he was doing uh, years back over almost uh, two decades ago to pioneer this subject. Praise God. But I'm telling you that if you don't honor the Lord, these other elements that people uh, in their heart would really appreciate to have some honor shown to them. It doesn't come. It doesn't come. It eludes them. Wow. Praise God. So when you honor the Lord, what happens? Honor comes to you. Unusual ways in which God will honor you before others. Wow. It is really, really 
Interesting. So my friends, I want you, yes, to be obedient. I want you to have a financial covenant with God. But I also want you to understand that when you tithe, you're not just talking the talk. You are actually demonstrating as a tither that God is first in your life. Again, in an area, which is finances, that a lot of people cling to their own ability to take care of themselves. And there's no way, there's no way God's going to get the tithe from them. Mm -mm. They are, quote, a self-made man or woman. But they are, they have put a brass ceiling over their heads because of their misunderstanding or uh, lack of knowledge in this area of honor. And that's why there are some things they want to get into. They can't get into. And it's because they have lightly, very lightly esteemed the Lord in this area. And he sees when Eli was not dealing with his sons and he could have said, boys, this is awful what you're doing. You're actually sleeping with the women that are working here at the tabernacle. This is outrageous. You've got to stop it or I'm getting rid of you right now. You must promise that you'll never do this again. But he never corrected it. He let it go on and on and everybody knew it. What a mess. What a mess. And the Lord said, because you showed your two sons more honor than you showed me. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. Mm, wow. God sees that when money comes to you, the first thing you do is take the tithe out. Woo! Praise God. Is it faith? Yes. Is it obedience? Yes. But it's also a missing ingredient in the lives of many Christians that they've never understood. It's also honor. You're honoring God when you do that. Woo! Praise God. Amen. And God is truly the one that can lift you up. God is truly the one that can exalt you. And God is the only one that can empower you to fulfill the beautiful destiny that he has planned for you. Amen. So get on his system, work his principles, and honor him. Amen. And now at this time, let's bring the tithes and the offerings into the storehouse of the Lord. If you would like to mail them in. Please send them to Stephen Brooks International, P.O. Box 717, Moravian Falls, North Carolina, the zip code 28654. If you prefer to go online and bring your tithes and offering in over the internet, you can do so. Please go to the ministry website, stephenbrooks.org. There's a link on the homepage. It has a red heart on it. It says give. You can click that and that's where you can bring the tithe in too. Praise God. Now, also, if you would like to sow special seed above the tithe, you would like to give an offering, then you can click on the orange banner that says projects. You'll see the various projects we are working on. Ooh, I'm very, very excited about them. Each one of those projects, as we engage them, um, such as the, uh, the new uh, ministry facility, wow, that we're going to raise up on the 14.5 acres, we're going to build it debt-free. Praise God. There won't be a penny of debt on it. Hallelujah. I'm excited about that. So let's beef these accounts up. Thank you for your tithe and your offerings. It helps us to move forward in the ministry, and it, it, it's, uh, it strengthens the covenant that you are in with God, and it allows God to bring honor into your life so that as you honor him, he bestows honor upon you and he'll do it in front of a lot of people too. Woo. Amen. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Father, bless your people. I thank you. I thank you that they're tithers, they're givers. They have a heart for you and they honor you above all, even their own children, which is what Eli failed on. I thank you, father. They honor you above all all. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. When somebody tells you that you don't have to tithe, they're basically saying that you don't have to honor and put God first. Mm, they may not verbalize that, but that's totally what the message is that they're communicating. Wow. Praise the Lord. All right. Today, let's take our Bibles and go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and before we jump into today's message, let me remind you that we have the Best of Israel tour. My wife and I, we're going to Israel. We want you to come along with us May 7th through the 17th, 2023. It's going to be 
amazing. I want you to really pray about going. Now, somebody might say, oh, Pastor Stephen, I, I don't think I want to do that. Look, for everybody listening to me and watching me right now, all I want to do is ask you one question. Have you prayed about it? Have you prayed about going? If you haven't prayed about it, would you please do that? I really believe you need to pray about going on this trip. Well, Pastor Stephen, what, what does it mean that if I pray and God says, yes, I'm supposed to go, it means he wants to meet you in the Holy Land. Oh, yes, you'll meet me and my wife in person, praise God. But it means that in a special way, God wants to meet you in the land of Israel, praise God. So I want you to pray about it, and I want you to come with me to Israel. We are going to have a tremendous time, praise the Lord. The best of the hotels, oh, best restaurants, it's going to be Fantastic. The best sights. Woo. Glory to God. Amen. Looking forward to seeing you on that tour, getting to know you and having a great time with you. Praise God. Now let's pray. Father, as we jump into your word, we ask that your Holy Spirit would come now, turning on the light with the spirit of wisdom and understanding, functioning and operating within our, within our hearts, the eyes of our hearts being illuminated. We thank you, Father God. We thank you, Father God. Hallelujah. Father, let your ways become our ways. We give you praise in Jesus' name. We say amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to talk today uh, about the subject of friendships. Now, chapter 15, and let's go down today to verse, let's go to verse 32 and look at the latter part, verse 32 por, uh, part B. If the dead... If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Now, Paul is quoting one of the poets of that era that was a very famous stating then. So that would be a mentality that those who didn't know God would have. But Paul said, as he continues, do not be deceived. So this is an area that Christians, if they're not on their guard, that Paul's about to explain, this is an area that Christians potentially could be deceived in. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts. It causes to rot and putrefy good habits. Again, evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. So evil companionships or evil friendships will corrupt your good habits and it will lead you into a spiritual lethargy and it will lead you in to sin. Jesus, we give you praise today. Of course, Paul here in this epistle is writing to the church in Corinth, which in the new Testament at this time, we would have to say that the Corinthian church was the most gifted church. They were all speaking in tongues. Uh, there are even, they were so many of them speaking in tongues. Paul had to give instructions in first Corinthians chapter 14 towards, you know, protocol and procedure. They were all operating in spiritual gifts. You could say that it was a loaded charismatic church because the gifts were operating and uh, they were knowledgeable. They had a lot of knowledge, but my friends, we would also have, it, have we have to be honest and also admit at the same time, while they were the most charismatic church in the New Testament, they were also the most corrupt church in the New Testament days. Actually, just about any kind of sin that you could imagine was taking place. And it sounds crazy, but it's true. They even got into fights during the communion. <laughs> well, Pastor Stephen, you mean when we were receiving the body and the blood of Jesus, uh, that they actually got in the quarrels, arguments, and fights? That's exactly what took place. There was uh, a lot of jealousy and envy also amongst uh, certain ones. There were cliques and little groups that, would, uh, that had formed within the church. And going even further, one of the church members had even won over his father's wife and was sleeping with her and living with her and the church didn't do anything about it. So Paul jumps in there and deals with the craziness going on in the church 
in Corinth. Now, it would appear most theologians do think that the man having his father's wife is probably his stepmother. But even still, crazy, crazy stuff going on there in the church. So we have to dig into this. Why was there so much corruption in the church in Corinth? And the answer is because after their salvation experience, after they were born again, they never separated from their evil friendships. They never separated from evil company. They still hung out with all of their childhood friends. Wow. They still kept their memberships at these various places, whether it's, you know, back in the, the days where Rome is, you know, dominating over these areas, the Roman culture had been tremendously influenced by the Greek cultures. Uh, and the Greek culture was totally pagan, all kinds of nudity and nude statues and sexual perversion. Uh, but the Romans loved all the knowledge and they loved all the beautiful things that the Greeks had created. And so they brought all of that culture and morphed it and expanded into more forms of idolatry and a hedonism. And now you have these big, uh, like hot tubs, big spas where men would go and they'd go in there nude and sit in there and uh, all talk to each other. And, uh, and then there's areas where the men and women are all together. And it's just nothing really but sexual immorality going on in these various places. We've heard about the early Olympics, uh, the Isthmus Games, all the origination out of that. All of that was done in nudity. And my friends, we're living in a crazy culture today where the Olympics, if we're going to be honest, we might as well call them the underwear Olympics because that's all they're doing today. Men and women, sadly enough, some of them, even Christians running around in nothing but little bitty underwear. And you, hey, at that point, might as well just take it all off. There's hardly anything to guess about at that point. <laughs> Thank God, maybe there's just a strand of modesty or decency left. But uh, the degradation of morals in the age in which we live is, it's really on par with the crude ancient cultures of yesteryear when gods and idols were worshiped and immorality and paganism and Satanism was celebrated. My friends, we see so much of that today, even though we have computers and satellites and smartphones and all of this other stuff, the world today is rife with ancient sins. And what took place with the church in Corinth is that although they were saved, they never disconnected from all of their sinner friends. Oh yes, back in Corinth, they still surfed around on Facebook, even after they were saved and looked up their old high school buddies. And uh, they, they made connections with those that they knew decades back, uh, even of the opposite sex and said, Oh, I haven't, I haven't seen you in 20 years. Thank God for Facebook. And Hey, let's get together for coffee. And then after coffee, there's other meetings and then there's secret meetings. And before you know it, that guy's ran off with that woman mm. or she has left her husband and her kids and she's ran off with him. Mm. What's going on here? What is going on is exactly what the Apostle Paul said. Do not be deceived. Evil friendships and companionships will corrupt, not might, will corrupt good morals. Mm, 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 mm. Praise God. You know, over the years, I've had uh, long lost friends contact me. I had a call a couple of years ago. And the guy on the other end was so excited when he called me. He said, Stephen, he said, I finally found you. He said, me and all of the other classmates, we had always wondered what happened to Stephen Brooks. Because just before going into junior high, I lived in the one state. So I was, I was with them for seven years and then went over, moved to another state. And this was back before the days of social media. So after, you know, six or seven years of forming all these relationships and growing up in that area, we moved. So they always wondered what happened to me. Well, one day they found me. They tracked me down. They said, oh, 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 oh man, we got to catch up. Oh, we got to, you, we got to cut. You got to come back. We got to get together. He said, matter of fact, he said, most of us have never left the area we grew up in. And he said, every Friday night, we all gather around a campfire and we lean back on the logs and we talk about the good old days. And I just said, hey, 
I said, thank you for contacting me. And I said, you know, we grew up together, but I said, I'm not like that anymore. I said, I've changed. I serve Jesus now. I live for Jesus now. And he and all of his friends and all of those that used to be my best friends, none of them have any interest in God. Zero interest in God. Woo! Mm. Others, old friends, maybe from high school or college days, would be sitting back maybe in their home or wherever they live at, be watching TV, maybe serving through the channels, and they come across a TV show, and there I am. I'm on, I'm on TV. And they're like, oh, oh my goodness, that's, that's Stephen Brooks. Oh, I went to class with him. I was friends with him in college. I, I was friends with him in high school. And they contact me, wanting to get together and rehash all the wild times of the past. And I'm like, hey, I'm a minister now. I'm a, it's not so much because I'm a minister. It's because I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian now. I don't do those things anymore. Oh, but Stephen, we knew you. We know what you're really like. Yes, you did know exactly what I was really like, but I'm not like that anymore. I don't do those things anymore. And I don't want to get around and group up together and start digging up all the stuff that the blood of Jesus has washed away. Mm, but they do. They want to talk about all that. Mm, mm, mm. But they have no interest in God. Right now, I know exactly, I know exactly what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, oh, but Pastor Stephen, maybe you should talk with them. Maybe you should go back and one-on-one -on -one minister to them or have them all get together in a group and minister to them. You could share Jesus with you. But I want to share some raw, honest truth with you today. It's easier for them. Here's the truth. It's easier for them to separate you from your relationship with God and your close walk with God than it is for you to bring them to the Lord because they may not want to go to the Lord. They may not want anything to do with Jesus, especially if they're in a group because a group has more of a corporate strength. Oh, well, Pastor Stephen, I think I'm going to go over there. Uh, you know, they're all hanging out at the bar. I'm going to go minister to them. No, 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 no. You're on their turf. You're on the enemy's turf. And don't be deceived. Evil company corrupts good morals. See, a lot of Christians, they try to straddle the fence. They want one side over here where they're serving God, but they want another foot over here where they're kind of in the world because there's a part of that they kind of like. They've gotten saved, and they're not willing to go all the way back into sin, but they like, they like dancing around the fire. Danger, danger, danger. I'm warning you today, be very careful of the friendships that you choose. Mm -mm. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Why was the church in Corinth so polluted? Why? Evil companionships. They got saved. They never broke off those evil companionships and evil friendships they had with wicked and ungodly people. And the whole city of Corinth was loaded with, uh, uh, with temples. Uh, you, you, had the, you know, it was a double harbor. So you had the temple of Poseidon. And all, you, you had these temples that had room for thousands and thousands of people to come into them. And there's cult prostitutes, women prostitutes, men prostitutes, anything you can think of of immorality. And it used to be a byword, sin like a Corinthian. Because that whole culture was known for sin. And the church is there right in the midst of it. So they got saved, but they never made that clean break. And they still have friends. They still have friends and go hang out with them and talk with them. Mm, praise God. So that's why the church in Corinth was so polluted. Because they were unwilling to give up their evil company. Let's go now to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. You'll see it. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I want you to see it as we unravel this today. We're going down now to verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light or darkness? What in the world would any Christian walking in the light want to go out to a nightclub for? What in the world would you want to do that for? Unless you're just intentionally 
wanting to destroy your destiny, mess up your walk with God, and end up in hell. Why would you want to do that? Because that's where they're all going if they don't repent and come to the Lord. Mm -mm. Why would you want to be in the den of iniquity like that? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, in other words, because God lives in you, therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Mm, praise God. Well, Pastor Steve and I, what am I supposed to do? I work with them. I, I, I work with sinners. That's great. That's fine. But that doesn't mean after work, when the five o'clock buzzer rings, that you got to go out and drink martinis with them. Have you lost your mind? That doesn't mean that you have to go out to the golf course with them and uh, group up with them and tell dirty jokes and listen to them tell dirty jokes for an hour. Mm -mm. Thank you, Jesus. Instead of you going down to the bar with them, why don't you invite them to a Bible study? Hmm. Praise God. Why don't you invite them to a church meeting? Why don't you invite them to sit down and talk about the things of God on your turf? Praise the Lord. Well, they're not really interested in that, Pastor Stephen. Then why would you be interested in them and hanging out with them? Hmm. Praise the Lord. Some of you are hanging out with sinners and to make it even worse, not only are some of you hanging out with them, you're actually receiving their counsel. Look at this in Psalm 1. Mm -mm. This is very, very revealing. The first Psalm, let's begin in verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Hmm. Praise God. Some of you Christian wives, you're married to a Christian man, but maybe you want certain insights, maybe a little marriage counseling. And of all the people that you could go to, you go to an unbeliever. And you pour out your secret information to them because you want this woman to counsel you. And she's not even saved. Hmm. To have an unbeliever as your secret counselor or as your, quote, life coach, you know what it does? It makes an absolute fool and mockery of your Christianity. What are you going to them for? What knowledge do they have outside of the Word of God that they can tell you? Praise the Lord. Mm -mm. You're basically telling them what I need. I cannot find in the house of God. What I need. I cannot find in the fivefold ascension gift ministry. What I need. I cannot find uh, out of the hundreds of millions of believers on the earth. I have to come to you uh, who serves the devil. And I have to talk to you to get some information from and some help from. That's what that says to them. It makes a mockery of your Christian walk. Praise the Lord. I know. Oh, I know there's some that might say, well, Pastor Stephen, I, I used to know that person in college. Uh, we've been friends, though, for many years. I allow that person, although they're unsaved, I allowed them to speak and counsel into my life and to give me guidance and direction. Again, don't be deceived in the thinking like this. You stand for righteousness, yet that person stands for sin. You supposedly stand stand for God, yet that person stands for the devil. And that person perhaps loves money or is a coveter or is into immorality and they think it's okay. What are you doing hanging out with them and that person being your so-called friend? Hmm. 
How can you call someone who stands for everything that you stand against? How can you call that person a personal friend? Hmm. Friendship that does not forget. It's not by force, but it's by choice. Don't play and mess around with your life and the destiny that God has for you. You and you alone are responsible for what your tomorrow becomes. Choose your friends very, very wisely. Praise the Lord. Even Jesus, with His mighty, unlimited anointing, even He surrounded Himself with 12 men who feared God. Now we know that Judas didn't. And we know that from the beginning, Jesus knew that Judas would betray Him. But at the same time, you see that shield of protection where he's got these 12 around him. And then there's another layer of the 70. And even John uh, was so close to Jesus that he had very, very uh, close relationship with him and deep conversation with him. But Jesus centered himself in the midst of a company of believers. Yes, he would go out and minister to sinners. He would go out and minister to to sinners, but he surrounds himself with a company of believers. Praise God. For example, do you want to be free from sexual impurity? Then today choose to disconnect from those immoral friends that you've been hanging out with and laughing with at work or wherever it might be. Disconnect from them. Some of you have uh, social media friends as if you could really have a friend through social media. But you have these connections and these conversations and these things that are being passed back and forth. Yet they're immoral. They're immoral. Why are you engaging in those types of relationships? There are certain relationships that you need to put the brakes on today and stop it today. Or I'll tell you right now from this pulpit, it will stop you. Do not be deceived. Bad Evil companionships corrupt good morals. Mm -mm. I want to make a statement that may seem a little bit unusual, but I want you to understand the heart of where it's coming from. Here's my statement. I don't have permanent friends. I only have permanent interest. Again, I want to say it. I don't have permanent friends, but I do have permanent interest. And if a friend, a current friend, chooses to disconnect from the God frequency of obedience and walking with the Lord, then, hey, I'm out. I'm out. Look, if you want to go play around with the devil, go ahead. I don't have time for that, and you're not going to corrupt my calling or distract me because you want to get silly. I'm going on with God. Mm -mm. It doesn't mean that even if we had sweet, sweet fellowship before, that that's some kind of a binding tie. No, my binding tie is to going on with God. My binding tie is to seek first his kingdom and the, his interest. Praise God. And if somebody begins to deviate that, that's been nice knowing you. Praise the Lord. But I'm moving on. Praise God. I had a, a minister friend a couple of years back. We had done things together, together before, but the last time I ministered for him uh, at his church, he seemed real Loosey goosey with everything. He's now going out watching violent R rated movies or very sexually overlaced R rated movies. And his whole characters now, it's like, uh, it's like changing him. And when we went out to eat, he orders a real hard liquor drink. And I thought that's, that's it. I'm done with this. I'm not, I'm not playing around with this. Well, Pastor Stephen, there's nothing wrong with drinking liquor. Beer brings cheer, but liquor is quicker. No, 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 no. You go play with your liquor. You go play with the number one intoxicant that kills more people in the world than all of these other drugs. It's alcohol. You go play around with fire if you want. I ain't having anything to do with it. Praise the Lord. You can go goof off. Mm -mm. But look, you play around with those types of things. And you associate with those who do, uh, let, let's say the person has a problem with lying. Watch out, that lying spirit will come over and get on you. You say, oh, that person's my friend, Pastor Stephen. I, I know they cuss a little bit, Pastor Stephen. Watch out. 
you hang out with them with their dirty tongue, the next thing you know, it'll start coming out of you. It will start coming out of you. You'll start using profanity just like them. Mm, mm, mm. If that friend is immoral, don't hang out with them. You'll become immoral too. Mm, mm. Thank you, Jesus. I like the song written years ago by Michael W. Smith. Friends are friends forever. Oh, yes, that's it, Pastor Stephen. We're all friends forever. Ha, ha. Friends are friends forever when the Lord's the Lord of them. If the Lord's not your Lord, hey, God bless you. I'm going on with God. I walk with covenant friends. I walk in friendship with those that fear God, serve God, and live for God. I'll minister to anybody. I'll minister to the drunk in the gutter. I'll minister to the homosexual. I'll minister to anybody. But as far as friendships, though, I walk and run with those who honor the Lord in the way that they live their lives. Not those who confuse other Christians because of their crazy way of living. When they're supposed to represent Christ, they're doing the exact opposite. <laughs> they're muddy in the water with the crazy lifestyle. Mm -mm. Praise the Lord. I heard Pastor Rod Parsley say something stunning a couple of weeks ago. It was so good. Matter of fact, when he said it, I, I couldn't help but laugh and laugh because I said, my Lord, it's so true. It is so incredibly true. You know what he said? He asked a question. He said, what is a charismatic? He said, a charismatic is a backslidden Pentecostal. And I said, oh my God, is that ever the truth? Is that ever the truth? Look, I, I lived for 10 years in Southern California. I could still, years back, I could still feel the effects of the Jesus movement. I could still feel the effects of the hippie movement when, when uh, uh, millions literally were being swept into the kingdom and spiritual gifts began to break forth and uh, people were excited and would prophesy and people would get filled with the Holy Ghost and they would uh, talk in tongues. But listen, listen to this. I've met thousands of them. I can count on one hand the charismatics that love holiness. On one hand, I can count the number of charismatics that actually love holiness. The others don't want anything to do with it. Even the word holiness is repulsive. It's actually repulsive to them. Oh, now, Pastor Stephen, you're just being legalistic. You're just trying to put people in bondage. No, no. I actually, uh, you know, there, there are certain churches today. You actually feel like you're in Corinth. Like, wow, hey, maybe this is like the second coming of the Corinthian church. <laughs> Woo, we got all the gifts and, oh, we can prophesy. Yep, and there's pollution all over the place. You can't even take communion without jealousies and quarrels and fights, actual fights breaking out among you. So what kind of a spirituality is that? Glad you're saved. Glad you're on the way to heaven. But is that spiritual sonship? No, that's spiritual diapers. Mm, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Mm, thank you, Jesus. Big, big charismatic church, Southern California. My wife and I were there. And uh, being, being trained and raised up in the things of God. And uh, the pastors, who were very carnal, really wanted to do something to kind of have a little fun. So they thought it would be a good idea to take the whole church on a cruise. So everybody, you know, will, will pay to get a ticket. We're all going to go on a cruise. And of course, they chose a cruise line that's known for raw hedonism. This is a cruise line where, yeah, just take all your clothes off and just go, go fun, have, have fun. And, uh, you know, the bar's there and drink all you want, get drunk. They actually chose that cruise line so they could have liberty. Because we're not under the law. We, we have liberty. And so um, I remember uh, one Sunday morning after they told everybody, look, we're all going to go on a cruise. We're going to have fun. Praise God. And uh, come back to the back and sign up. And on the way out of the church, my wife and I walked past the sign up place for the cruise. And they had a life size. They had a life size cardboard picture, full color picture of a woman, you know, uh, that would look like she's going to go on a cruise. And she's standing there with 99% of her clothes off. 
And the only thing, just a little strap here, a little strap down there, and she's standing there almost completely, you know, a picture, life size, they'd put next to the cruise sign up table. And uh, almost completely nude. And this is in the sanctuary, the back of the sanctuary of the church. And I, uh, I walked by the table. I said, uh, Pastor, uh, to one of the associate pastors, I said, uh, I said, that's a pretty wild sign. Uh, that's a pretty wild picture to have up in the, in the Lord's sanctuary. He said, now, he said, that's what we're just trying to get away from. We're trying to get away of a religious spirit just like you. Religious spirit. <laughs> I smiled. I just smiled and I said, Lord, feels like Corinth in here. Feels like the Corinthian church. Oh, they would all get so excited about prophecy. Mm -hmm. Felt like I was in Corinth. Amen. Oh, but they were so excited about their trip. They were going to go on a cruise together. Hundreds, hundreds signed up for it. And just before they were about to embark on the cruise and the cruise company was going to give them all their tickets. And there was a church member that signed them all up because she worked for the cruise agency. Just before it was all supposed to happen, the person that owned the cruise company ran off with all of the money, $400,000 cash, ran off, and there were no tickets, and there was no cruise. And now you have hundreds and hundreds of Corinthian Christians who are very upset because they've just paid a couple thousand dollars, and now there's no cruise. And they're, they're oh, Pastor Steve, I'm sure they were all loving and forgiving. Oh, no, the, the, the Corinthian Christians don't act like that. They're like, where's our money? We just stole our money. And now it's just a big, big mess. Mm, watch your friendships. Watch your friendships. The pastor that told me that has disappeared out of ministry today. He's, he's just gone. Probably never get back. The other pastors, the other associates also that were there, that never quite understood holiness and certainly weren't into it, they're either all dead or completely out of the ministry today. Mm, wow. My friends... The friendships that you have dramatically affect you fulfilling the beautiful destiny that God has for your life, or, or they will distract you from it, pull you out of it, and if it's bad, could even pull you into hell with them. And if they do that, ain't nobody jumping out into that grave with you and them to go along for the ride. You made that decision. I'd say cut those things off before it cuts you off from the fullness of what God wants you to experience. Mm, mm, mm. Praise God. First Peter chapter one, first Peter chapter one, verse 15. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Most charismatics, they actually get angry at that scripture. It actually it like makes them angry. No, well, we want to have fun and we want to prophesy. I love what Pastor Rod Parsley said. What is a charismatic? A backslidden Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. We have the gifts. Enjoy yourself with the gifts, but without the fire, without the baptism of fire, you're incomplete. You're incomplete and you will be carnal and you will be... <sighs> Pulled along these lines of the flesh nature. Mm. And I, I have to admit, for some, they struggle in these areas because nobody has ever taught them. Nobody has ever taught them. I have never heard one charismatic preacher ever teach a message on holiness and purity. Never. Never. I've heard every other message under the sun. Now, because I'm teaching this, and this goes around the world, there will probably be a few that might email me and say, well, Pastor Stephen, I have. <laughs> That's good. You're the rare bird. Praise God. But listen, my friends, our roots are in Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, the church was birthed, and they were baptized and immersed and filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our roots are in Pentecost. You must have the fire. You must embrace holiness, and bad friendships corrupt the beauty of holiness. Praise the Lord. I will say that church that my wife and I belong to, that that was a church where many of the members never relinquished all of their carnal friends outside of the church, all of their sinner friends who loved the sin, because this was a very sensual, very, very wealthy area uh, in which the church was based, much like Corinth. 
And when you have all of that sensuality and a lot of money, a lot of wealth, it can be very, very distracting for believers. It can be a real challenge to get rooted. That's why Paul worked so hard to get the church in Corinth rooted in the things of God. Mm, but you can, you can undo that if you maintain uh, sinners as your friends who counsel you or you hang out with. And, um, whoo, Lord, have mercy. Look, my wife has full authority to speak into my life and say, Stephen, I don't know about that person that's wanting to connect with you. She has full permission to speak to my life and, and say, I don't think that person is the kind of a uh, person needs to be around you. And I also have full permission to speak to her life and say, Hey, that lady wants to be around you. She's a, uh, uh, no, 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 no. Some stuff is weird there. Stay away. From that. Don't let that person around you. Amen. We guard and protect each other. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God says no to friendship with both the ungodly and also with Christians who live ungodly lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 9, the Apostle Paul has to do a little corrective teaching here because they have previously misunderstood him. So he says, I wrote to you in my epistle, and we don't have that letter, but he said, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Don't have a meal with that person who maybe says they're a Christian, but they're sleeping around, a womanizer, whatever the case might be. Mm, I'm telling you, if you have the wrong friendships, that spirit that's on them can jump over on you. If you sit back and watch James Bond movies, the next thing you know, that spirit of a womanizer is going to get on you. And you'll be trying to move in this element of seduction and all of this stuff. Watch your friendships. Watch the people that you have in connection with your life. Watch what you allow through your eye gates and your ear gates. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Don't let your anointing or even your spiritual maturity deceive you. Evil company corrupts good morals. I don't care how strong in the Lord you are. If you hang around it, it will wear you down and it will begin to corrupt you. I don't care how anointed you may be. If you start getting around things that are polluted and defiled, it will corrupt you. The scriptures cannot be broken. And you and I aren't any exceptions to these verses. Mm -mm. Leave those old friends you had before you gave your life to Christ. Leave them. Well, Pastor Stephen, if I do that, there'll be a disconnect. Oh, you mean so they won't follow you because they're not into your God? Yes. Go ahead and leave them. Yes. Praise the Lord. They know where you're at. They can read, they, they can look you up if they want to know about the Lord. Mm -mm. Do not let them drag you back to the vomit of sin. You have no idea how sneaky the devil is in these areas. Do not let them drag you back to the vomit of former sins. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 11. As a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. As a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. You get around those old friends that you used to know back in the old days when you weren't saved and stuff like that. You get around them, they're going to want to pull you right back into that stuff that they're still in and that you used to do. And uh, watch out, because that's like going back to the vomit. Do you want to be free from sin? Then look, it's very important, look for godly Believers to have as your friends. There's your answer right there. Thank you, Jesus. Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs 13, verse 20. 
He who walks with wise men will be wise. Walk with godly Christians who are wise. And what will happen is that iron sharpens iron. You will strengthen each other. You as iron cannot have a block of wood sharpen you. So why are you hanging out with a block of wood? The companion of fools, the person that hangs out with fools will be destroyed. Hmm. Praise you, Lord. Again, your destiny is priceless, but I want, to, I want to let you know right now, the devil is looking for ways to corrupt your destiny and to keep you from getting to, this, to the fullness of it. He's looking for ways to destroy it. Be aware of that. Protect yourself. Protect yourself. And you will increase in righteousness. Praise the Lord. 1 John chapter 5, our last verse. 1 John chapter 5. Verse 18, we know that whoever is born of God does not practice sin, but he who has been born of God keeps and protects himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. Now look, keep and protect yourself. Protect your friendships. Protect who you allow into your friendship circle. Be very, very careful about this. Be very, very careful about this, because you'll have those that will be coming some of them are actually sent by Satan himself. They're actually sent by the devil to distract you, to get you off focus, to get you in the sin. Mm. And if you were gullible enough to even to get you into the grave with them, mm -mm. watch out, watch out, take these things serious. Don't be in fear. Take them, however, very seriously. Praise God. Keep yourself, protect yourself. And the wicked one will not be able to touch you. Praise God. Lift your hands. Father, I pray for all of those that are watching today. There are those that have heard this message and they are in bad business deals with literal crooks. But the money's good. Lord, may they make the commitment today to get out. Get out and drop that before, their, before the plan that you have for their, your, for their life is destroyed. Is destroyed because of those evil friendships. Mm, Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. We give you praise. We give you praise. Oh, Father, we thank you. Let the devil's plans be fully exposed today through the illumination of Scripture. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. Now, Father, there are some that are watching that need some good friends. Lord, let those friendships come by your Spirit. And friends are friends forever when the Lord's the Lord of them. Father, let there be lifelong friendships that extend into eternity. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Lester Sumrall said that if you have four good friends, you are extremely blessed. You are extremely blessed. If you have four people that are like iron, that can sharpen you, that are walking with God, that, that are into the things of God, and that you know them, and those relationships are formed, oh, wow, you're a very blessed person. Amen. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're watching this message today, and you don't know Christ, and you know you're on the outside of eternal life, today, you can receive Jesus and have your life made right with God. I want you to pray this prayer. Pray this prayer from your heart, and Jesus will save you right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I repent of all of my sins. Come into my heart and save me now. Jesus, wash me with your precious blood. Write my name in your book of life, and I give my heart to you completely today. Jesus, step into my life and lead me. And guide me from this day forward. In your name I pray. Amen. And amen. And one of the first things the Lord is going to do. Is show his friendship to you. He's also going to bring some beautiful Christian friends. Into your life. Now let us lift our hands. Let us lift our hands in praise to the Lord for his goodness. For his faithfulness. 
for the godly friends that he has given us. For many of you, godly friends that he's going to be adding to your life. God, we give you praise. We give you praise. The Lord is lining you up to walk with wise believers. Father, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. Praise God. Let's seal this message in our hearts today by taking communion. The Word of God is seed. The seed has been sown upon the soil of your hearts. So that the enemy doesn't take it and steal it from you, causing you to forget it or overlook it or maybe push it away for a season. Let's take Holy Communion so that this Word produces great righteousness within our lives. Praise God. I want to ask you to grab some uh, some unleavened bread, a little wafer, a little cracker, whatever you would have available, and grab some grape juice. Praise God. That's what I have here in my nice cup. And let's pray. Father, we thank you for the bread and the juice. We bless it right now, and we consecrate it. That is, we set it apart as being holy. And we thank you, Father, that this is now the body and the blood of Jesus. Father, as we receive the body of Christ, we thank you for centering us with good godly friends all around us. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We thank you for the removal of wicked counsel out of our lives. Thank you, Father. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us receive the Lord's body. I know in some ways that this message is a continuation of the subject of the cross, that there can be the element of carrying, or there is the element of carrying your cross and the persecution that comes from that. I know, it is, I know exactly what it's like to be in a workplace where I'm not invited into certain circles because they know that he's a Christian. Right. But you know what? While there may be persecution in that area, some ostracization because of that, they, in my past days when I, you know, when, before the Lord put me in full-time ministry, while they wouldn't want me in with them because of what they're doing and because I'm a Christian and my strong stance as a Christian, while there was a separation there, but at the same time, they had tremendous respect for me. They had tremendous respect for me. And I often had people come up to me in private and even ask Stephen, uh, please pray for me that I could have strength like you do. I'm a Christian. I thought, you are? You're, you're over there with them, engaging in all of that. But they want, they would want to serve the Lord. But I remember again, like Corinth, if you don't make these cuts, these dividing lines or a line in the sand, um, you know, you, you, have to, you have to let people know where you stand. Praise God. If you don't do that, They'll pull you in, and the next thing you know is corruption begins to take place. But God is preserving you today. God is giving you wonderful friendships with godly people. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. We thank you for cleansing and forgiveness of all of our sins. And we forgive anyone that has sinned against us. Thank you, Father God. We give you praise. We thank you for the blood of Jesus saturating our lives, flowing over our lives, we proclaim His death until He comes, because it's through His death that we have His life. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive the Lord's precious blood. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Some of you are thinking, Pastor Stephen, I've got a I've got a couple thing, a couple of friends to deal with. How do I do it? Sometimes you have to just be straightforward and say, I can't be doing this anymore. I can't be your friend anymore. I can't do this stuff anymore. I love you, but I got to go on with God. I can't do this. You know, you come out of stuff like drugs, alcohol. You can't be hanging out with druggies and alcoholics. I was very sad. And my wife and I were very sad in a few weeks ago when we had a gentleman doing some work at our house, and he said, oh, he said, Stephen, he said, I haven't tasted alcohol. I haven't had any alcohol for quite, and he told me how long it had been. I said, oh, my friend, that's wonderful. That's wonderful that you haven't had any alcohol. So remember, it's one of the greatest killers on the earth. 
That's so wonderful because he was, an, he was a complete alcoholic. And he said, I haven't had any for this long of a period of time. But he said, I just went out with a man that was a Christian man. And uh, he sat down with me. And this man's you know, like a leader, an influencer. And this, the first thing that this Christian man did is order a beer right in front of a recovering alcoholic who is exercising all of his strength and willpower to stay away from the demon of alcohol. And here this Christian man orders it right in front of him. And the Christian man says, oh, well, uh, he said, well, you don't mind if I drink this in front of you. I know you've had some struggles in the past, but you don't mind if I uh, indulge, do you? And the guy said, uh, no, that's okay. But see, he doesn't want to be around that. He doesn't want to be around that. Why? Corruption. He'll go right back into it. He'll go right back into it. Mm, praise the Lord. Father, bless your people. We thank you that we understand that evil, evil companionships, evil company corrupts good morals. Father, I thank you that you are leading and guiding your people on the straight path to heaven. And one day we will all meet in heaven and we will all rejoice, O oh God. We thank you. We celebrate your word for it is truly a lamp unto our feet. Father, strengthen your people. Thank you that they'll know what to do and they'll know what to say. Their words seasoned with salt, spoken with love and grace. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. And amen. Remember, with love and grace also means that still there are times you have to be very firm with your no, I will not do that anymore. And I cannot hang out with any, you anymore because you're still wanting to do that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for watching. I'll see you back next time. Bye-bye.